Hi, well, good morning. It's, um, and we're here today. This is another interview for the Organizational Research Methods July issue. And today we're going to speak with Eric Quintain and Lucia Falzone about temporal brokering, a measure of brokerage as a behavioral process. And just, we're going to get a little bit of the background story in this interview and just kind of find out what motivated the authors and any final thoughts they have or hopes for future research regarding this topic. So without further ado, we'll get started. Thanks, Elizabeth. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so like I said, first, I just want to know what motivated you to write this paper um, in the first place. <laughs> Would you like to start, Lucia? Oh, I think, um, well, I guess it's a long story. Um, I, I guess we've been working on um, networks of interactions for a while, um, but I guess we have a new take on, on, on how networks work, particularly when it comes to communication events. Um, and we have been, uh, we have been trying to understand how measures work on these types of networks as compared to um, standard, I suppose, social networks, which are usually um, modeling static relationships among people. And I guess brokerage is one of the things that is, is very useful to, to, to try and um, formalize and measure in particularly in, a, in an organizational setting. Um, so over to you, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lucia. Yeah, I, but I, I think I would say very, very much the same thing, is that most of social network analysis has been developed around cross sections and kind of relatively static images of networks. And we assume processes that occur you know, to make networks look like, uh, like they do. And then we have, uh, we, have some, we have methods for longitudinal networks, so multiple cross sections. But then when it gets to a, a, you know, a, a range of new data sources and new data structures, such as email, uh, email interactions, um, uh, uh, phone calls, interactions over phone calls, or even uh, message boards, so a whole range of new sources of data that are now accessible in organizations for, for management scholars. We, we don't have equivalent methods or measures. We're starting to develop them. And so um, Lucia has been, has been working very much on the algebra of those temporal networks. And together we've been der de deriving a set of measures. And now we wanted to more specifically focus on a measure is quite interesting for a lot of management scholars, which is that, that measure of brokerage, because brokerage is a central concept in social net, network analysis. And we wanted to find a way to use more of the richness of those interaction data in, in order to capture more specifically the process of brokerage rather than trying to characterize the position of a broker. And so that's that's what um, that's what triggered the, the, the general. So that's it's part of a, of a general research project where we are really interested in in all of those temporal networks and trying to build the the baggage or the tools, the type of tools that are the disposal of network and organizational organizational network researchers to actually analyze those networks properly and analyze them by taking advantage of some of their unique characteristics at the time and the sequence uh, of the event. That is amazing. I've really just started dabbling into network analysis, trying to understand it. So this article was really exciting and felt like it was kind of going more and trying to go more into that black box of how these things occur and really answer those type of questions and making um, I feel like some of the other measures is you're just making a lot more assumptions um, mm. about the nature yes. of <laughs> how these networks are working. Um, so my second question is, what are the two key takeaways you want research researchers to walk away with? Hmm. 
if you let you start again I'll let you start again <laughs> you sure you want to start with this one because I'm not we can, sure do, we can do one each if you want <laughs> <laughs> well I, I think for me it's the fact that Eric has alluded to it already that that these um so brokerage is actually a process it it uh, it, it is something that goes over time it it's it evolves over time um and I think to me that that is the that is the, the 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 crucial the crucial thing here is that we are really treating brokerage as a process and able to characterize it properly um, rather than just a, as Eric said rather than just a network position um, yeah I, th I think to me that that is the crucial bit yeah, and so I completely agree. I would have said that that bit first as well, which is we we actually eyeball, we show that it, it is possible to characterize brokerage as a process and and without relying on on respondents' perceptions. So, which is some kind of meta aggregation of what do they think that that brokerage process is is uh, is happening, and we can observe it. So. Obviously, we could do very deep qualitative analysis of the process, but so what we're trying to highlight is a different path to, to look at that process. I think the second point will be, for me, it's, it's more at a, at a broader level to show it is possible. It is possible to develop measures that are specifically suited for those very rich interaction events. And, and I think we're which we're showcasing one specific measure. And, and, and I think that's gonna to link to your to a next question, which is, and that what I think is that that's the impetus we're trying to build towards developing more of those methods and measures to, to develop from network analysis in a direction in which we can, we can capitalize on those temporal networks. So I, I think what we are doing, we're, we're trying to show one way to do it, it's not, the only way, it's not necessarily even the best way, but but we're we're showing it can work and it it is meaningful. And we in the paper we actually spend quite a bit of time also articulating what we think are the potential avenues for research that that this opens. Like really trying to understand not only the process but how that process itself changes over time or it changes in different conditions or circumstances, and and that's still not it's still not very common in um, in network analysis yes it's, i haven't really seen it up until now so um i i can i can understand so i really appreciated that that paper uh your paper so in when you were in the writing process were any were there any surprises or issues that came up oh yes i'm sure they did oh. <laughs> <laughs> um so um yes definitely so i mean one of the difficulties was trying to um trying to move away from the the mindset that we had um of social network analysis as a static network and trying to understand well what is it that's happening here you know how how is this different to what happens in a in a static network and essentially the the um the realization is that when we um when when we represent networks in this way what we're actually um modeling uh, is the sort of the, the 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 transfer of information along a path in the network and that this is quite a different object to to a a, a normal path of the network in a static in a static network which is really just looking at the the structure of the network itself, a static structure. So what what I guess we um, and, and it took us a while to understand this. I think um, is is that what we actually have is the is the fluid um, the the fluid transmission. I guess um, and when why this is different to to a normal network path. I think that was uh, a, a sort of a something we had to grapple with and even though we had a, a in a sense it almost as though we had a superficial understanding of this but we uh, we really came to to grips with it writing the paper so mm. that was one thing for me anyway 
Yes, I will completely agree with that. And and I I think um, I think it is difficult because we don't really we don't really understand how this works, uh, and there is not much support in the literature to help in conceptualizing. I wouldn't even go towards theorizing, but just conceptualizing networks as flow and then characterizing those flows uh, is uh, it, it required quite a bit of work. I think for me another another learning has been. Um, you know, I th and I think it's been quite helpful is that we don't also, a, a lot of the literature and networks has been, a lot of the measures are based on matrix algebra and it has, I don't think the literature itself has paid a lot of attention to try to understand what, what it means to develop a valid measure, I've kind of develop measures that are based on very rigorous mathematical definitions but we're we're using them in a relatively flexible way when it comes to interpretation and what we see in network analysis is that there is a proliferation of slightly different measures that are that are very you know they're 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 very clear mathematically but then you know those differences in interpretation become very difficult to understand so i think the process we've gone through uh, in the review process has also pushed us a lot to, uh, to articulate, so to make the paper what it is now, which is it's a lot more of a, a measure development process where we actually try to demonstrate convergent, divergent or discriminant validity, criteria validity. So we're trying really to go through the process of showing this is a valid measure that we can use to represent something specific. So there's still a, a little bit of interpretation because at the end of the day, we, we measure something and it can represent a slightly, you know, slightly different concepts of, of processes uh, apply, apply in different contexts. But we are quite close. We know that in, different, in very different contexts, so we have three empirical data sets. In those empirical data sets, it behaves exactly in the way we would expect given a set of other measures that we're measuring at the same time. And that that did that wasn't there in the in the original version that we submitted. It came through the review process, and I, I really enjoyed that part of forcing us to 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 take the the time to show how it it fits within a a, a network of other measures. Yes, I, and in the end, it was a much better paper than than our original one. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. It, you you talked about having to change your mindset understanding to really get to that that process component um, of, of social networks. Can you explain how or advice you could give um, other people who who research social networks? Could you explain to them how they can also make that transition or give them advice on how to kind of step out of the way they've been thinking about it up till now in that more static way? Uh, yes. Difficult well, question. Oh, I didn't. <laughs> it, is, it is a difficult question. Um, I think I think this sort of thing happens out of necessity in a sense because, um, if you're looking at if if you are if if you are um, analyzing uh, observational data, then I think uh, observations lend themselves to sort of representing these things as interactions rather than you know uh, you know you, if you have survey data for example you're asking people about their relationships but if you're just observing you're typically observing interactions and i think people need to come to that realization if that if that's what if that's the data that they have you know so um uh, and um i, I mean I, I i don't know i guess eric might have a different take but to me it was a question of uh, what is it that you're really doing? I mean, if you are observing interactions, then you you are either forced to make assumptions about those interactions that you've observed that you're obs observing, and that they are um, a sort of a proxy measure for a relationship, which is a huge jump to make essentially. Or or else you treat the data just as it is. It's an observation of an interaction. So um, I I think. To me, that that's sort of why we need to think about these things differently. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I always get the benefit to to have Lucia's wisdom just before I talk. So this, <laughs> this is actually, I put myself in a really good position. Um, so I agree with Lucia, of course. Uh, you know, I think, uh, I think what, what I understand from, from what she's saying is, um, is that you, you need to actually be very aware of what your data is and mm -hmm. the data structure, you know, what are you really measuring in the data? And, and that's, I think that's, uh, that's been always core to our, our, us trying to think about the, the temporal networks. It's uh, going back always to, okay, what is it that we're really measuring? And I think a lot of our explorations, or a lot of the difficulties we had and we still have uh, are, are related to, to trying to, to do too much at the same time, trying to uh, embark with the, quite a bit of complexity, and in the in the development of this paper, we you know we we you know our advice would be to ourselves if we were to start again would probably be just keep it as simple as possible. Just don't don't try to go too fast too quickly, um, and you know we're doing that again now the same mistake. So. We're, we're trying to, you know, keep it as simple as possible, have a, one very specific thing we want to look at and then try to, to conceptualize it in depth within that, uh, that new understanding of those networks. Well, I think that's all really great advice for, because, you know, a lot of times those are the people who are watching or people who are interested in using the methods that um, the authors um, propose. Uh, so you really touched on this. I'm not sure if there's anything else to add, but is there anything that came up through the review process or something you had to change or particular insights, maybe beyond what you already spoke about or just adding to what you already spoke about? Um, no, as I think as we've already said, it was very valuable for us to, to go through that and to... Um, to, to get a sort of an outsider's view of what we're doing. Um, it was really, really helpful, yeah. Mm. And I think both the, the, the reviewers and the editor really engaged with the paper. So it was, um, it, was, it was quite a fruitful conversation throughout the review process where we had to change quite a bit and reflect on, on some of our assumptions when making the measure. Um, so, yeah. Mm. So, uh what would be your vision? Um, you're an idealist. Where would you see this work influence your research? I know you mentioned kind of people uncovering a little bit, but maybe you can go into uncovering how to examine social networks in a different, you know, not a static way, but if you could elaborate on that or either share something else. Oh, well, um, I'm not sure. I, I think we we. I mean, we're still on this on this journey, and we're still looking at um, how to characterize various other network um, objects. I guess, like um, uh, you know, sort of substructures and networks and clusters, and to understand more about to really exploit the the information that we have in terms of. So at the moment, we we certainly use sequence. But we would like to also use the the time information that we have in the sense that, um, you know, for example, if you take the length of a of a of a path. So in in our in our network analysis, we have not only the the number of hops in a path, but we also um, can also use the duration, for example. So this this concept of duration. We're not really exploiting that too too much at this stage. Um, it's, it's something for us to to consider, I think. What do you think, Eric? Do you think that that's right? Yeah. So I I think there there for for me um, there are multiple sets of opportunities. One, as as Lucia is mentioning, mm -hmm. is is going deeper. Is trying to um, characterize even more. These um, these streams of of interaction events. Um, I think the way I, I see this evolving is is um, is opening up um, 
you know, a realm of measures and methods that enable us to represent organizations or, you know, communities in a, in a much more dynamic uh, and, and, and time conscious way. So trying to really um, represent social processes as they occur in a way that is more that is more directly representing what is occurring so mm -hmm. rather than than passing through a perceptual process and i have nothing against the perceptual process i think it's a great source of data but it's not it's not equivalent to behavioral data and what i and that's why i think our whole endeavor is to try to say we can't use measures that have been developed for perceptual data in a behavioral source of data with exactly the same interpretations it doesn't make sense and then once we start looking at that you realize but there are many other things in the behavioral source source of data that we can use like sequence like timing like duration that we're not using in a perceptual sense because it doesn't really make sense it doesn't make sense really to to look at a specific uh, start and end date of a trust relationship or friendship at the levels of analysis that we have in organizations at the temporal levels, there is, there is no, it, it's not that meaningful. In interactions, the, the time and sequence are very meaningful, they are very important. And so trying to develop a, a new, a, that new set of tools for organizations or for organizational researchers to be able to characterize those processes is, uh, I think it's a very exciting opportunity. Obviously, our hope is that we can use those measures to show that, you know, not only looking at overall position, but at specific micro level processes will actually enable us to understand much better how organizations are developed or, group, or how groups and people you know, coordinate over time uh, in specific conditions and therefore have a much more, much more fine tuned way to understand those, those dynamics. I think one, one big advantage of those data sources is that they are, they are unobstrusive. You, you, can, you don't need to rely on people spending a lot of time doing, um, doing surveys. So and, uh, assuming that there is, it's within a legal, legal and ethical framework, you can have access to sources of information, behavioral sources of information that if you can uh, measure them or characterize them correctly, they, they can lead to, to very significant insights. So I, I see this for me as a, as a way to push forward relational analytics, uh, that really trying to drive a new understanding of organizations, groups, communities, as, as they evolve through time. Yeah. And, and um, to, to add to that, we have uh, from time to time thought about uh, how good it, it might be uh, to to have both sources of data and then try and understand a bit better how they relate to each other. I mean, we know that they are different, that they're dif different, completely different beasts, if you like. So, so um, the data for a static network is completely different to, to the sort of interactional data and it sort of tells us about processes. But on, on the other hand, if we had both, we may be able to understand a little bit more about how they relate to each other. Yeah, and it, I really like how bringing in that time component and understanding, you know, how I think you would just get so, so much richer information because at that static time, you're it's kind of always after the fact and people mm -hmm. make assumptions when they're answering those surveys or they're getting tired and they're just getting some level of survey fatigue. <laughs> and, you know, what you're getting is you they may not even remember all of it. Um, there may have been some level of decay or you know, they're not quite sure and they're kind of making assumptions of how those things happen. So I think it'd be really fun to tie the two together in some way um, as well in, in my mind. But do you have any other final thoughts you'd like to add? No, I think I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm quite happy. We covered a lot. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I just want to say thank you for your time and all your hard work on this. And it's just another, um, it's a great, another great article uh, this week in the interviews where we really get to kind of dive in to these methods and how they can really push um, the literature forward. So uh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you.
Thank you very much for listening to us and for caring. <laughs> it, was, it was my pleasure. <laughs>